Smothers Brothers Hour, Dr. Spock interview, take two. You know, the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour is uh, supposed to be, and is generally, uh, supposed to be variety, dancing, and singing. And oftentimes there are guests that we would like to have on the show that aren't necessarily dancers or singers or uh, performers. And in this case, we have someone we'd like to bring on and talk with you for a few moments and talk with us. Very distinguished man, Dr. Benjamin Spock. Let's welcome him. I'd like to start with a question and ask you just how you did get involved with this anti-war movement. It was way back in 1962 when I suddenly realized that if more and more countries are going to accumulate nuclear arms and be testing them, the fallout is going to create more and more cancer, leukemia, physical defects, and mental defects in children. I realized that all those previous years I'd been denying the danger, so I thought mm -hmm. it's time to get to work. So it's definitely your involvement with the newborn children that, that led Doctor, to it. Doctor, how did, how, tell us about how you found out and when you found out that you were indicted recently. How did that come about? I'd gone, I was in New York. I'd gone downtown uh, for an errand, and uh, I was coming back on the Lexington Avenue subway, and a man was uh, reading uh, the New York Post, and in letters about four inches at ha high, it says, Spock indicted. And I tried to uh, move up to him a little and look over his shoulder to see if I could read the fine print, but it was too fine. And I thought I could ask him for the paper and say, you know, that's me. And then I thought, that's so improbable, I can't make myself do it. Doctor, your, your trial that you went through must have been very fascinating. Uh, can you tell us about anything about your trial? Well, uh, if you'd asked me ahead of time whether I... I uh, in a trial for a federal crime, I could have been as casual as I was. I wouldn't have believed you. For one thing, it went on for four months, and that, that's enough to make you bored anyway. <laughs> the fact that there were five defendants somehow made it all impersonal. I felt as if it was a movement that was on trial, not me as an individual. What I'm leading up to is that on a number of afternoons, I went to sleep at my own trial for a federal crime. You know, there are lots of times when there are what they call bench conferences. The lawyers want to argue a point. Out of hearing of the jury, the judge slides up to the end of the uh, bench and the lawyers huddle there, sometimes for 10 or 15 minutes. This will bring on sleep, especially You're after right. lunch. Do you think the judge got a little upset with you for sleeping, you know? No, uh, he, he, slept he sometimes too. slept too. The judge, <laughs> <laughs> I was only 65 and the judge was 85. Oh, no. <laughs> well, he was right with the, the, the new generation. Uh, I understand that sometimes there's been occasions when uh, your book has been held responsible for uh, some of the unrest and riots in this country. Yes, Reverend Norman Vincent Peale uh, says that I'm responsible for all uh, the protesting in the uh, younger generation. Because this irritates me, first of all, because I never was a permissivist. Uh, I was brought up very strictly, I brought up my son strictly, and I thought I was writing a book which merely tried to undo rigidity, but I never thought that it was going to be called uh, permissive. Uh, Is it, uh, how, many, how many copies has your book sold? 21 million. In how long? In 22 years. Uh, well, you had a bad year, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, why didn't you work through the due process of law to make your, your, your um, d you know, what you wanted to do? Why didn't you do as a normal process? Yeah, I did. Um, for one thing, uh, when Lyndon Johnson was campaigning for the presidency in 1964, he said, I will not escalate the war. I do not believe in sending American young men uh, to fight a job that should be done by uh, Asians. I not only believed him, I worked for him on radio and television. Mm -hmm. So much so that I got a telephone call from him within 48 hours after the election, and he said, Dr. Spock, I want to thank you sincerely for the work that you've done for my election. And then he said in this humble voice, I hope I will be worthy of your trust. And this so embarrassed me to have the President of the United States hoping to be worthy of my trust that I said, 
Oh, President Johnson, I'm sure you'll be worthy of my trust. <laughs> Little realizing that within, well, what within three months, uh, he betrayed me, and I would say all the millions of Americans who voted for him as a peace candidate. I wonder... <clears throat> I wondered at the time why, you know, he had the, the his foreign policy was diametrically opposed to uh, to Goldwater's right. in the campaign. Then all of a sudden, he, like he changed his mind. It he was, took over Goldwater's uh, foreign was, policy. Doctor, right? is there a is there a significant difference between draft dodgers and say draft resistors? Very definitely, in my mind, uh, I think a draft dodger is a person, an individual who tries to find a slightly sneaky way to get himself uh, out of the draft. Uh, the, the group that I respect very much and got in, uh, indicted uh, for standing behind are the draft resistance. These are young men of idealism and great courage, I think, who uh, in many cases have given up their educational deferment in order to refuse to, to you know, became, uh, got into a 1A status and then refused to be uh, go into the army because they felt the war is totally illegal and totally immoral, just the way I do. And then they risk five years in jail. I don't call this dodging. Uh, this is draft resisting, and I think it takes a lot more courage and idealism uh, than to go into the army. Right. Then these were individuals who could have sustained their deferment had in they many cases. Had, had they wanted to go on with school, but they, uh, at their own volition, said, "I will not be deferred." Right. And just to test. And you can understand why people who believe in the war in Vietnam, I think of them as, mm -hmm. uh, as unpatriotic. I think they're highly patriotic and highly courageous. Now, what do you think, uh, now, uh, what is the most positive aspect or the positive thought we could think about what is happening, that what's happening now in this country is, is quite upsetting and there's a lot of change and there's a lot of, of problems, but what is the positive aspect of what could come about? I think that the only thing that I feel really encouraged about is the young people, the idealistic and realistic uh, young people who are willing to look at the problems of America and look, look at the problems of the world and then uh, become active about it. And this is something that we haven't had since the 1930s. That, that brings another point. The people who are, are involved in these demonstrations, what kind, of, what kind of young people are they? I think they're wonderful. At least 98% of them are. I've been in a lot of demonstrations myself. Mm -hmm. Most of them are idealistic, law-abiding, uh, peaceful, I would say, loving people, and I'm proud to be marching with them. Anytime you have 40 or 50,000 people, as you did at the Pentagon, there are bound to be a few hotheads right. uh, who used uh, obscenities, and this is what the press uh, pays attention you to. You think ultimately that, that this would probably be the, the biggest benefit from this is the, is the uh, involvement of the young people in right. what's happening? Right, right. It's the, the only thing that keeps me going. Doctor, uh, is, there, is, there, is your life different now? Since you are, you are a famous baby doctor and your book is everywhere, uh, have you found a big difference now that you are now a, a criminal? Uh, it's, in the first place, it's very hard for me to realize that I'm a criminal. Of course, I'm not kept in jail. I'm out on a bail, and we hope by next December to get out, uh, to get absolutely uh, free from it. It's never actually discouraged me because I'm absolutely sure that in my own conscience uh, that I'm right. What you about know? your rehabilitation? Oh, you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what shocked somebody that I'm staying with uh, here in Los Angeles is that I now have a probation officer, <laughs> and I have to go to the probation officer and talk about such things as how many drinks I have and whether I quarrel with my wife and whether I go to church, things like that. Does he ever ask you about uh, his child? <laughs> He's a very serious-minded uh, man, and I try not to trifle with him at all. That's I want to be on his good side. Tell me, do you have any feeling whatsoever, and uh, one of the arguments against the young people's participation in the demonstrations, that they are being duped by foreign powers and that their, their young minds are being toyed with and, and, and playing up to the, uh, the communist powers? Oh, this is, to me, absolutely ridiculous. Uh, I know hundreds of young people, uh, most of whom are very scornful of uh, mm -hmm. communism, and uh, I actually know half the leaders, uh, for instance, in the uh, Chicago and the demonstrations against the, uh, uh, the Democratic uh, Convention there. And these are highly it. idealistic people, and they wouldn't have anything to do with you the communists. see communist. no parallel, because in the 30s, there was a lot of uh, problems with the... Uh, That's right. In, ...in that realm, but that... 
Because these it. modern radicals uh, think of the communists as old fuddies uh, stuck with a <laughs> worn out uh, doctrine. Uh. That's having trouble <laughs> enough at home, right? Right. <laughs> uh, we'd like to uh, wind this up and thank you, Dr. Spock, for coming on our show. And let's have a big hand for very good Americans. <laughs> <laughs>